Yeah. Okay, so good morning, guys. I hope all of you haven't got too big a headache after last night's gala show. Um, so before we begin, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name's Chris Brown. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Mango Map, which is an online web map publication platform. And I'm also uh, the author of the free ebook Online GIS, which I'm going to cover briefly today. Um, I wrote the book, I think, about six months ago now. Um, it's free, and you can download it at onlinegis.com, or you can get it from the Kindle store. And the Kindle store, I think it's 99p or 99 cents. They don't allow free. Um, the book is basically an overview of all of the cloud-based web map publication products that have come online um, in the last year or two. So it's only about 50 pages. It's not designed to be a detailed description to give you all of the information about each product, but what it will do um, is give you an overview of each product, let you know about the use cases that each product is particularly suited to, and what type of people um, each product uh, is aimed at. Um, I've only got 30 minutes today, so we're not going to be able to go into much detail. Uh, we're going to do a bit of an overview of online web mapping in general. We're going to do a little overview of each one of the products, and then I'm going to give a demo of uh, Mango Map, um, our product, at the end. So, moving on. So there's been an explosion um, of cloud-based web map publication platforms in the last year or two. Um, obviously, I've mentioned Mango, um, but we've got some others like CartoDB, GIS Cloud, GeoCommons, um, ArcGIS Online, of course, and Mapbox. Um, how many of you are familiar with um, some of these products? All of you. How many of you are familiar with all of these products? A couple of you. OK, so I think most people are going to learn something today. Um, so the first thing you're probably wondering is why is the CEO and founder of Mango Map um, giving presentations at conferences and writing books about his rivals? Um, the reality is that I don't view most of these other products as our rivals. I think the best way to look at most of these online publication platforms um, is tools in your toolbox. So I think it's a good idea to familiarize yourself with all of them. Um, and all of them are better suited to certain use cases, um, and some are better suited to others. Um, and some are better suited to certain skill sets, and some are better suited um, to other skill sets. So let's have a look at the history before we begin of web mapping. So let's see uh, who made the first web map here. How long has everyone been web mapping here? Anyone more than five years? More than eight years? More than ten? OK, right, right. We've got, we got some hardcore people in here. So. <laughs> Right, so if we go back and we think about web mapping, um, and we look back like eight, ten years ago, uh, was it easy? No. No, it definitely wasn't easy. Uh, was it cheap? Very expensive. It was very expensive. Okay, so this is where we were um, when I was first making web mapping, <coughs> web maps. Um, web mapping was very expensive. It was expensive um, in terms of man hours, or it was expensive in terms of vendor products. Um, Back in times gone by, if you were paying for vendor products, a typical web map portal custom built solution, you'd be looking at north of six figures every time. Um, if you were going to use the um, open source products that were available at the time that weren't as mature as they are today, you still had to put in a lot of developer hours. Um, before we built Mango, um, I cut my teeth with web mapping in Southeast Asia, building um, web map portals for development aid agen agencies such as uh, World Bank, UN, DFID, uh, these kind of guys, who are very price sensitive. Um, a lot of the data that they were collecting, they just simply didn't have the budget to justify six figures on web mapping systems. So what we tried to do um, is implement web mapping systems as cheaply as possible using the open source components that were available at the time. And what we would do is each time we would build a system, we would try and automate as many of the manual processes as we could so we can do it more quickly and more cost effectively um, the next time around. So, back in the day when we were building these web maps, the big problem was, and what added complexity to this, is it was very rare to find programmers who already knew about geography and already knew about GIS and understood datums and projections and lat long and all of these things. Um, I know because I was one of those guys. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a geo immigrant, not a geo native. Okay? I'm a software developer who got dragged into this. Um, and then on the flip side of that, you had GIS guys, geographers, um, who didn't understand web programming. It's very rare to find those people. So when we used to build web mapping systems years ago, what you would do is you would chuck a few programming guys with a few GIS guys 
you'd lock them away in a dark room and say, right, build a web mapping system. And between you, uh, you would kind of figure it out. Now, all of us realized that moving uh, everything geo to the web was the future. We all, know, we all knew that that was where it was going to go. So a lot of us were thinking at the time, this needs to be less complex and it needs to be a hell of a lot cheaper. So a lot of people were looking at this, all of the products we're looking at today, and wondering how can we do this. And the obvious route is to take one of these two people out of the equation. And I think you'll find that most of the products we look at today have taken one of those paths. So one path is to make mapping stuff easy for web developers. Take away all of the complexity of projections and datums and all of these things that confuse us programmers. Um, the second path is to make um, deploying web systems easy for people who don't know how to code, who don't know how to maintain web servers. So you've got guys like Mapbox and CartoDB who have gone the route of making um, deploying web mapping systems very easy for web developers. Um, you've got the other sort of line of products, uh, Mango Map, GeoCommons, um, GIS Cloud, who have taken the route of removing all the complexity of deploying web servers and writing code and offer user interfaces that allow um, anyone with geodata to configure web maps. And then of course you've got the 500 pound gorilla in the room which is Esri and they have ArcGIS Online who are I think trying to do everything and anything. Okay. So why now? We've known for a long time, we've got guys in the room who have doing, been doing web mapping more than 10 years. We've known since day one that this was too complicated and it was too expensive. So why has it only been in the last couple of years that we've seen these products start to emerge that are simplifying um, and reducing the cost um, of deploying web apps? Come and take a seat, guys, if you want to come in. <laughs> come in. <laughs> um, so for me, there's, there's two elements to this. There's two reasons. The first one's going to be obvious to everyone here because this is the community that made this possible. It's the maturity of the open source libraries and products that are available today. Um, a lot of these guys have been around for a long time. The libraries have been around for a long time, but in recent years they've reached the level of maturity where entrepreneurs and startups look at those libraries and think, I can build a business on top of these. Um, for us at Mango Map, um, before we were Mango Map and we were building custom web mapping systems, we were using Map Server and then we started using GeoServer. Um, and like I said, whenever we were deploying systems, we would always try and write scripts and automations to make it quicker next time. But we could never fully automate the process. The big turning point for us was when GeoServer released their REST API. As soon as they released the REST API, that was the point where we realized we could fully automate this system and develop it into a self-serve system. And this is another way of reducing cost and complexity. If you can go to a website, sign up to an account, and you don't have to speak to a person, this reduces complexity. Um, if at the same time, you don't need uh, people, um, uh, you don't need to go to an individual in a company to organize a web map, you can serve yourself this reduced cost, because we don't have to have people engaging with each customer. The second side of the equation is obviously the cloud. And we're getting a bit sick of hearing this now, everything's the cloud, the cloud. Um, but basically distributed computing and using Amazon Web Services um, has been huge for us. I know there's other cloud platforms out there, but the reality is we're all using Amazon, 99% of us. Google's got some stuff, Windows got, Microsoft's got some stuff, but most of us are here. And just to put this in context, how much of a saving this is, when we used to build, say, web map portals five or six years ago, we would deploy each one uh, to a managed, dedicated server that would cost us roughly $300 per month. To put that in context, $300 a month in terms of Mango um, I can use that to host 5,000 maps. So we've gone one to 5,000. This is a huge shift. So on one uh, extra large instance on Amazon, um, in terms of Mango, we can put roughly about 20,000 maps on there before we have to start going sideways, uh, sc scaling horizontally. So this is a huge savings. This means that we can reduce the cost because we're removing uh, the people from the equation and we're moving expen removing the expensive service from the equation. Uh, we're getting into a Moore's Law type situation uh, where the cost of deploying web, web maps uh, is coming down to a very low point. So what I'm going to do now, I would love to give you a demo of every one of these products, but we only have 30 minutes and it's simply impossible. Um, so what I'm going to do is give a brief overview and I'm going to tell you the reason why you should look at each product. So if one of the reasons fits your particular use case or needs, go look into this further. If you want to find out a little bit more than I'm saying today, go download the ebook. 
Um, it's only about 50 pages, and that will give you a little more insight. And I'm just going to go through an alphabetical order, okay? So there's no particular order these are coming out. So the first one is CartoDB. Um, who here has used CartoDB? Okay, one or two. Guys, you, especially for this crowd, the Phosphor G crowd, you really have to go and check this one out. Okay, CartoDB um, has been built for web developers. Okay, it's taken that angle. It's not a user interface driven system. There are some user, in, uh, user interface parts to it. So you can do some basic prototyping and things with the interface. Um, but the real power of CartoDB, um, if you have a system where you have a requirement for real-time updates, so if you're updating data and you want those changes to be visible on the map immediately, CartoDB does this really well and it does it extremely quickly. There's some real magic going on behind the scenes of this system. Um, Javier from CartoDB, is, he's here at Phosphor G this week. Um, he's not in here though. Um, Go and speak to him if you want to learn about some of the magic that's driving um, CartoDB. And it also has the power of PostGIS. So how many of you here have used PostGIS? It's Phosphor G, everybody has, of course you have. So CartoDB, normally if we want to use PostGIS, we have to go and we get a Linux box, and we install a load of libraries, and we install PostGIS, and we do all of this, and then after like a day of messing around, we can start loading some data in there, and we can start doing some queries. With CartoDB, Go and sign up for a CartoDB account. It will give you a web interface. You upload your data. You can style some maps. And through an HTTP API, you can throw PostGIS SQL queries uh, straight via your browser to the back end of the system to either update your map or return spatial results. So you can do so anything that you can do in PostGIS, you can basically do in CartoDB, and you can do it via an HTTP API. It's extremely powerful. So advise, especially for the crowd that we've got here today, go check this one out because you'll really love it. Next one, ArcGIS Online. So go and take a look at ArcGIS Online if you want a Swiss Army knife. So <laughs> ArcGIS Online is kind of the jack of all trades. Um, I don't blame Esri for this. Esri is the big, like I said, the 500 pound gorilla in the room. And when you're the big guy, you have to please everybody. So they sort of cover all of the bases. Um, they have, you can configure ArcGIS Online via a user interface, and they also have some APIs. I'd say the APIs aren't anywhere near as clean and as nice as, say, CartoDB or Mapbox, but they're still there. Um, and if you also want vendor lock-in, obviously Esri being Esri, they're going to be trying to push you towards their other products at the same time. Um, and also if you want complicated pricing. I'm not sure if anybody has gone to the ArcGIS Online price calculator. <laughs> Don't, okay? <laughs> If you want to be confused for several days, go check it out. Okay? There's, it's very unclear what a web map will cost until you've actually deployed it and you have traffic coming. Um, next one, GeoCommons. Who's used GeoCommons? Oh, there's not enough of you again. So the crowd at this place should really be checking out GeoCommons. Uh, GeoCommons um, is basically a place um, that encourages the sharing of open geodata. So if you have any spatial data sets that are open and you want a platform to share them, then Open Ge uh, Geo Commons is the place to do it. When I first came into the sort of geo world, I was shocked to find that there's no central place where we can go and find open geo data. We have these mysterious government open data portals that spit out crappy formats that I don't even know how to use. And then you've got shapefiles buried in the darkest corners of the internet, and there's no metadata, there's no licensing information, there's nothing. Okay, Geo Commons is looking to solve that. If you go on there, you can easily search and find geo data. Um, and part of this product, apart from sharing data, you can also publish web maps using the data that's on there. So um, as well as putting your data there, you can build some visualizations to showcase the data that you're sharing on GeoCommons. Um, it has a very smart UI. It's very easy to use. <laughs> right, back on. Um, and it also has some cool little features like temporal maps. So if you have any timestamps inside your GeoData, it will run, inf it will run animations on your... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Is this me or you? Okay. Um, and it also has some really nice. Uh, it's like when I look away. Oh, yeah, I think I'm just. There we go. Okay. And it also has um, some very nice sliders that you can use for doing sort of advanced search stuff. So it's very user friendly for people who aren't familiar with desktop GIS. So. Next one, GIS Cloud. So GIS Cloud, the rest of the ones we're looking at today are primarily publication platforms. Uh, GIS Cloud um, is actually looking to be a GIS replacement. 
So it's looking to replace the traditional um, client-server GIS infrastructure. So if you would like to move that into the cloud, um, check out GIS Cloud. Uh, the interface, it has a slightly steeper learning curve than all of the other products we're looking at today. There's a lot of features in there, uh, but it takes quite a long time to uh, get into. I've, got, I've done 15, I've got 30 though. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay all right, cheers. Um, uh, so you can also do field data collection with this system. So if you're looking for an alternative to client server GIS and you want something that's online, uh, check out GIS Cloud. Mapbox. So who's used Mapbox here? Okay, Mapbox, Mapbox is really hot. Okay, I really love their branding and their style. But when we think of, when we think of GIS folks, this, this week typified it. Who was here for AGI before Phosphor G? Only me. Okay. <laughs> The, the AGI, you're probably all familiar with AGI though, it's the, um, what does AGI stand for? It's the GIS, it's the, the GIS Association in the UK. And it's like two different worlds in the geo community in this country. You go to AGI, everyone's on Windows computers and they're wearing suits and they're carrying business cards and uh, no geo beards. Um, and then we come to the Phosphor G and everyone's, everyone's on Linux and everyone's hacking, everyone's in trainers and jeans, everyone's sporting their geo beard, <laughs> everyone's drinking beers in the bar. So we have these two different crowds. You've got this like really heavily geek crowd, and then you've got this business crowd, but we haven't got the sort of hipsters in the middle. Okay, these guys are the hipsters. Okay, they do really cool stuff, really good looking marketing, really good looking branding, and what they're really focused on is being a, a replacement for Google Maps. Okay, as you know recently, Google Maps put a limit on the number of tiles you can consume from their services before you start getting charged. So Mapbox are stepping in and they're providing a service um, whereby you can have, do heavy customizations on your base maps. It's based on the OSM data. They've cleaned it up heavily and done a lot of work on it. And they have some really attractive themes. So you can make base maps that fully match the branding of your business or your company. Um, they also take cartography really seriously. Um, they use Carto CSS. Has anyone used Carto CSS? So yeah, allow you to style your maps using CSS. So once again, anyone who's a web developer will be able to jump straight into this. The APIs are very clean. They can style the maps in CSS. All the complexity of the mapping stuff has been completely removed. Um, and once again, you can deploy this at scale. So Mapbox is looking for big companies who want to have full control over their maps and their base data. OK, now Mango Map. <laughs> <laughs> Mango Map is number one. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm a bit biased. I'm the founder of Mango Map. Mango Map's my baby. Uh, rather than explain it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a quick demo just to show you what it does. So as I said, Mango Maps, um, our objective is to reduce the complexity of web mapping um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of price and also ease of use. Um, you don't need to know any coding to use Mango Map. You don't even know how to use a desktop GIS. Anybody who has access to spatial data and is technically competent enough to figure out Facebook should be able to publish maps on Mango Map. Okay, that's where, that's where we're aiming this. Now, most of you guys are programmers, so you're thinking, oh, I don't need that. I know how to code. I know how to use desktop GIS. I do too, but I still use Mango because it's so quick. Um, it's like blogging. Uh, for example, I could write my own blog in Rails if I wanted to, but when I start a blog, I don't. I just go and use Tumblr because I'm lazy. Okay, and it's the same with Mango Map. I use it for prototyping. Um, and I use it just when I need to roll out quick web maps. It's not a replacement for custom built web map solutions um, because it follows the 80-20 rule. It has the 20% of features that are used 80% of the time. It's not trying to cover all use cases, okay? But for most use cases, uh, you'll be able to jump in. <laughs> no, <not sure. laughs> um, so we'll give you a quick demo now. Now just while I'm moving across to the browser, uh, if you go to mangomap.com, you can sign up straight away. There's a free account. It's not time limited. So anyone can start making maps. Uh, there's no barriers to stop you jumping in. Um, let me. OK, so there's the home page. Fill in three form fields, and you're in, and you can start making maps. Now, what I'm going to show you today is we aim to make map creation as quick and easy as possible. So you can make um, impressive visualizations like these in under half an hour. Um, I often give demos. If any of you want to come over to the Mango booth outside, I'll give you a demo of making a full map. But you can make things like this in under 30 minutes. Um, 
This is a map showing forest cover change in Cambodia. Um, on the right is 1997, on the left is 1973. The dark green stuff is the stuff that's worth something. And as you can see here, there's forest disappearing. So um, the maps that are published with Mango, they have basic functionality in there. We have print functions, so you can print a, a 300 DPI print um, with a legend. We have search, so you can search, do full text search on the attribute table. Um, and we also have advanced search, you can build queries. Show me all of the provinces where the amount of deforestation is greater than 30% and, da -da 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 and build up a query, and it will highlight the features. But the most powerful part of Mango is how quick it is to make a map. So what I'm going to do now, internet permitting, is make a new web map for you um, and in under five minutes and just show you how quickly we can throw together an attractive map. So if you log into your account for the first time, hit the create new map button. I'll rip out my microphone. We're going to make a new map. Now, once again, we've taken a lot of time with usability testing. The objective here is that you don't need to read an instruction manual, you don't need to figure it out. The system's going to try and guide you through it. So we're prompted to add a layer. Um, we can either upload a new shape file, or we can choose from data that I've uploaded previously. Um, to save time, I'll just choose a shape file that I've uploaded before. Um, I'm going to use this Mango uh, Manhattan building data. Um, I'm going to add it to a group layer. I'll just call that group layer default. Save that. And now it's going to prompt me to style the map. And the map's going to zoom into Manhattan that this data's for. So this data is parcel data for Manhattan. It has every building in the Manhattan area. And the attribute table contains information about the year of construction, uh, the height of the building, who the original owner was, who the current owner is, uh, things like this. So I'll just close this styling window a second uh, so we can see the data here. Um, I'll zoom in so you can see what it looks like. OK, we've got some parcel data, but at the moment it's not really telling us anything. It's just telling us where the parcels were. Um, so let's make uh, a graduated color legend. We just press the edit button. I can do single color, unique color, graduated color. I'm going to hit graduated color. It's going to show me all of the columns from the attribute table. This is a huge attribute table for this data set. I'm going to choose number of floors. I'm going to choose a color ramp. Yeah, I'm going to do a red one. I'm going to do four class breaks. And this color is going to be one floor. This color is going to be three floors. This color is going to be 13. I found out the other day that 13 floors is a mid-rise in the US, and 39 is a skyscraper, apparently. I don't know who chose these numbers or why, but that's how it is. OK, so you can see with the click of a button, uh, we now have a, a legend here. We just wait for the tiles to draw a second. Uh, we now have this uh, thematic map. Now, here we can also make some other customizations. Like here, the base map, we're using OSM. It's a little bit busy for this visualization. It's distracting from the main data. So I can change the base map. Um, we've got Bing, OSM, MapQuest, uh, and a few others, a few other custom ones. I'm just going to use a really simple admin and road outline just to try and make this uh, data pop a little bit more. Now what we try to do is, in terms of the visualization, we try to have sensible defaults for the colors. So people who are not cartographic experts can make something that looks pretty good without trying too hard. Uh, we didn't do this in the beginning of Mango, and I used to see some really ugly maps. So we started trying to um, steer people into some more attractive color schemes. Um, if, you, if you want to get more into the cartography and customize things some more, uh, you can do things like change the color, change the opacity. Um, I'm going to get rid of the opacity in the outline here to try and uh, make that data um, stand out a little bit more on top of the streets. So go there, no outline, click of a button there. The usability testing for Mango has been done using the method that I call uh, mum testing. That means if my mum can figure it out, then it works and we can continue. If she can't, then we have to go back to the drawing board. OK, so we've now styled the map. Uh, we can also add other features to the map. We can do things like password protection. Uh, we can add search or identify. We can drop push pins on top of all of the features. Uh, the push pins are clustered, so the push pins won't color in the whole map. 
Uh, we can do feature highlights, so when you mouse over any of the features, they're highlighted. Once again, we haven't got the full range of features that you see in every WebGIS, but we're trying to cover the core features that are most um, commonly used. Um, I'm going to change the template now. So we have a series of templates that you can choose from. You saw the slide to compare template a minute ago. Um, for this map, because we only have one layer, I'm just going to go for the clean and simple template and add it to the map. So in only a few minutes, we've quickly thrown up a thematic map. We've made a few customizations. I can now hit the publish button, take a copy of the URL, and then I could email that out to my colleagues, email it out to my peers, put it on Twitter, put it on Facebook, and it's only taken 30 minutes of my time. So this is what we're talking about, reducing the complexity and cost of web mapping. Um, years gone by to make a thematic web map like this and put it on a server, it would have taken us months and hundreds of hours. And now we've reduced it to the point where it costs nothing and it's taken us a few minutes. Okay, so it's the, the Moore's law of web mapping. Um, in addition to building maps on Mango, uh, your data can also have a life cycle within the system. So you can take care of data management from within the system. I'm going to go to my data directory. Do, do, do. So all of the layers that you upload to Mango um, are available in your data directory. And let me show you what some of the things you can do. So I'm going to go here um, to cities. I'm really rubbish at naming shape files. I never have any conventions, so I'm not sure whether this is going to be the cities for. Uh, so this is the cities for Laos. Oh, actually, I was demoing this one yesterday. So we've got the cities for Laos. So straight away, I can have a little look at my data. I can see where the points are. Um, if I want to get the data back down, I can download it in CSV, shapefile, or KML format. Um, I can also re-upload the data. So if I've done some edits on my desktop, I can upload the data again. I can also edit the fe edit features on the system. So if I just oh, I'm not pressed edit yet. There we go. So if I want to edit a point, I could click on this city in Laos, for example. And if I wanted to cause an international incident, <laughs> I can move it into Vietnam um, and change the attribute data and save it. So you can have a life cycle of your data within Mango. Every account also has its own private WMS feed. So all of your layers in Mango, you can take this WMS endpoint, you can feed it into QGIS or ArcGIS, and then you can get all of your styled layers from Mango straight down into your desktop uh, GIS. Okay, so that's basically what we're doing. We're making publishing web maps easy. We're making the very sort of simple stuff of data management easy. And as with all the products we've looked at today, we all have the shared objective of reducing the cost and complexity of web mapping. So I would encourage you to look at all of these products, not just Mango, and look at them all as tools that you can have inside your toolbox. So next time you have a web mapping project, before you go jumping straight into the code, you can say, will one of these uh, products that we looked at today tick all the boxes um, for my project? Okay. Thank you. Um, does anyone? Does anyone have any questions? Uh, what am I doing? No. <laughs> we, Did you repeat the question? Uh, yeah. So the question was: Do we support any other coordinate systems apart from Web Mercator? You can upload data to Mango Map in any coordinate system. Okay, within reason. Custom coordinate systems, we've not quite nailed that yet. But anything that's on spatial reference, uh, we can handle it. Um, but we reproject everything to Web Mercator because we need it to align with the web maps that we have, the base maps that we have on the system. Um, when we first built Mango Map, we supported, uh, we allowed you to keep your native um, coordinate system, but we found that it failed the My Mum test. Too many people got confused with this, so we decided to go for the just everything Web Mercator. Yeah, you can serve it out with WMS. Yeah, w, the WMS, you can suck it up in whatever you like. Yeah, so you have that option. But we, actually, within Mango, everything's Web Mercator. Okay, cheers. All right, okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We'll quickly get on to the next